Today on Horsepower, phase two of our ultimate 383 stroker build. It's a step-by-step -step build on the top end of a soon-to-be pavement-pounding pump gas small block. When it goes on the dyno, we're shooting for 450 plus horsepower. Welcome to the Horsepower Shop and part two of our 383 stroker build. Last time we kicked off this project showing you details on how to build a short block and how it makes more sense and actually costs less money to buy new parts for this project than it does to custom machine your old ones. We also took time to show you some vital pre-build blueprinting steps. How to check for clearances, degree the camshaft, and properly assemble the bottom end. Now it's time to turn our attention to the details of the top end. And yes, even though all these parts from Summit Racing are bolt-ons, well, there's always room for more horsepower if you're willing to take the time to do some basic blueprinting. And the first thing we want to do is disassemble the new aluminum cylinder heads, including locks, springs, seals, and screwing studs and guide plates. Our goal is no more than 10 and a half to one compression ratio, which is about the limit for a pump gas street engine. True engine building is all about details, measurements, and math, and just in case you weren't paying attention in math class, Summit Racing has an online calculator that will tell you the final variable in determining compression ratio. That's the compressed thickness of the gasket. We already know our bore is 4030, stroke is 3750. Advertised combustion chamber number is 64 cc's, and our piston volume is plus seven. But here's how we can verify that combustion chamber number. With the head level, we'll grease up a couple of valves and drop them in place. Then screw in the right reach plug. We'll put a little more grease around the combustion chamber and install the plate. After filling the barrette, centered over the hole, we'll fill the combustion chamber till all the air's out. And the barrette verifies the advertised number. Back to the calculator, our deck clearance is 15 thousandths, and we'll enter the most common compressed gasket thickness, 40 thousandths, which gives us a 10.49 to one compression ratio. If the compression ratio was too high, we'd use a thicker head gasket, too low, we'd use a thinner one. That's why we chose a multi-layered steel gasket, because you can order them in 10 thousandths increments. And now that we've dialed in our gasket thickness, we can snug down ahead so we can determine the correct push rod length. After a little dicum on the valve tips and two of our roller lifters in place in the number one cylinder, we can install our push rod checker and lock down the Summit roller rocker arm. We turn the engine over two complete rotations. Next, we can remove the rocker arm and check the sweep pattern. The closer you get it to dead center, the longer valve train parts are gonna last. Now you can correct your sweep area by ordering longer or shorter push rods and Summit Racing can actually turn a custom set around in under 48 hours. Since we got to wait on ours, we're going to get ready on port matching. We're going to be using the gaskets that come set up for these larger 200cc intake runners and placing them on the head shows that they're pretty close. We just got a little bit of cleanup room to do. But on the other hand, most intake runners actually come small. That way they can be opened up to what you want and our dual plane high rise intake is no exception. We've taken it to an area away from the engine. First, putting on a little blue dicum around each runner entry. Then, use bolts to properly locate and hold the gasket. Scribe around the ports. Then, slowly work metal away with a carbide burr. And finish up blending it out to the scribe lines. Now, you really need to plan the better part of a day for this job. But when you're done, here's how the intake and gaskets can line up. But when you're going for those big horsepower numbers, that time can be well worth it. But you could still be leaving a lot of power on the table if you don't fit that intake to the heads. So I cut away an intake manifold to show you guys what improper runner alignment looks like. This will cause turbulence and can cost big horsepower. Now the way you can check yours is by lining up the bolt holes. Now if they don't line up, you can correct it by adding an extra gasket to raise it, a thinner gasket to lower it, or in extreme cases, having the intake milled. Now, yes, you can just elongate the bolt holes and get the intake to fit, but that misaligned runner can actually cost anywhere from 20 to 50 horsepower. We're gonna get these heads off and get them over to the dirty room so we can finish up their cleanup work. 
Since we've already got port match CNC runners, we're just gonna make sure we don't have any sharp edges and blend everything together. That's it for the port work on the heads. Next is another little blueprinting step. Touching up the oil return holes can help get the oil down to the pan quicker. And after this, we'll get these babies cleaned up and show you some precision valve train tech. It goes without saying these new street strip heads are ready to bolt on right out of the box. But we've been taking time to completely massage them. That way we can squeeze every bit of performance possible out of this 383 stroker. And next, we want to make sure that the new larger diameter valves aren't too close to the pistons. We start by putting a little modeling clay into the piston valve pockets. Add a little motor oil to keep the valve from sticking to the clay. Add the gasket. And with two checker springs in the number one cylinder, we snug down the head. Then add two of the hydraulic lifters, push rods, and rocker arm. Adjust the rockers to zero lash, rotate the engine four complete rotations, and remove the head. Looks like we only have a tiny indention from the intake valve, which means we have plenty of clearance from the valves down to the piston. Now remember, the minimum clearance should be a hundred thousandths. That's why it's always important to check this. Our new stainless steel valves are bigger, lighter, and stronger than the original factory ones. Now they're also undercut right here to help that airflow out into the combustion chamber a lot better. Now to make sure our valves are perfectly mated with our seats, we're going to lap them in. First, we'll put a little machinist die on the seat for a visual reference. Then apply Loctite lapping compound to the face of the valve and install it. Then use a lapping stick to spin the valve lifting and rotating it until the valve seat is completely lapped in. And once you've done enough of these, you can actually hear when it's seated. This is important because the exhaust valves can see temperatures up to 1500 degrees. Now this little 40,000 seat area is the only way the valve has to dissipate heat as it momentarily contacts the seat. Now since we've already got our cylinder heads apart, it's good engine building practice to go ahead and verify your spring pressure and ours are set up for a hydraulic roller. Each one has an inner and an outer spring and a dampener that will help stabilize it up to 7,000 RPM. First, we need to know the installed height. The checker will show us the exact distance between the spring pad on the head and the bottom of the retainer. Ours is an inch 800. Next, we'll check each spring for its installed seat pressure. And we're looking for no more than 125 pounds. More than that could lead to a bent push rod or a collapsed lifter. Now we need to verify our open pressure. Now what that is is when the valve is open from the camshaft, the amount of pressure the spring's making to close it shut. Now what we're looking for is about 350 pounds. The reason we need that much is because at higher RPMs, it'll close that valve and keep it closed, keeping us from floating the valves. Our roller cam has 550 thousandths inch of lift. Now we just subtract that from our install height to the inch 800 and that leaves us an inch 250. So we'll set our install height checker to that and then recheck all our springs. And at 340 plus pounds, we'll be just fine. Now we've all heard the term coil bind before. Now what that basically is, is when the spring is completely compressed and the coils are actually touching. That can cause one to break and it costs you a motor. Now we're using a set of dial calipers to show you how to check for it. Compress the spring to max lift. Once you found it, compress the spring till it physically stops. We've got 100 thousandths clearance, which is the exact minimum. Now we can put our heads back together. First, with a little oil and all the guides, then rub a little white lithium grease on the valve stems. And when I install each valve, I like to spin it, which ensures I've got adequate clearance. Then reinstall the shims with some grease underneath them to help hold them in place. Next, I can reinstall the valve guide seals along with the springs and retainers. And finally, to hold everything in place, drop in the locks. Now I've got a little trick I want to show you guys to make sure those locks are in place and seated securely. Just get you a soft rubber mallet and whack them all lightly a couple times. If that lock is going to come out on the tables when you want that to happen, not in the dyno room or in the car on the first fire up. Since we've got everything tore down, checked and cleaned and reassembled, we're finally ready to get on that top end.
Before we start assembling our Stroker engine's top end, we got a couple of final details to handle on the block. First of which is installing this billet pointer that needs to be set up at top dead center. So with a bridge over the number one cylinder and rotate the engine until that cylinder is at the top of its stroke. Then we can adjust our pointer to zero on the balancer mark, lock it in place, and we've ensured accurate ignition timing. We do like to soak the lifters in oil, but just for a few minutes to get the roller bearings completely lubed. To keep the lifters from spinning, we install these lifter guides and to make sure they stay in the lifter bores, this guide hold down. We're using multi-layer head gaskets, but to ensure we get a perfect seal with them, we're going to coat each one with Loctite high tack gasket sealer. After 10 to 15 minutes, when it starts to get sticky, we can lay the gasket on the deck and put the head in place. Remember, we're using a factory style block, which does not have blind bolt holes. Our ARP bolts go all the way through to the water jacket, so we have to coat the threads with head bolt water jacket sealant. Without this, water could push through the threads and cause all sorts of problems. There are two very important steps to torquing down head bolts I want to stress. First is the fact that you need to torque them from the center out. Otherwise, you'll have uneven clamping and you will blow a head gasket. Now, second is to torque them in the sequence. We started at 45 foot-pounds, stepping up to 55, and then the final torque specs vary according to the engine. MLS head gaskets are designed to expand and contract. This way each one gets completely compressed. With the guide plates installed, a little assembly lube on both ends of the push rods will keep them from galling during that critical moment of initial fire up. Then we can drop on our Summit 1-5 ratio rocker arms. And here's a simple way to know when it's time to latch the valves. When the exhaust valve starts to open, you can set the intake lash. When the intake starts to close, you can set the exhaust. And on a hydraulic camshaft, each one gets a half a turn past zero lash. Now that our long block is complete, we can pour in royal purple break-in oil, hook up a temporary oil pressure gauge, then using this priming tool, spin the oil pump shaft to make sure there's adequate oil. Now, believe it or not, actually firing up a brand new motor like this without a proper prime can actually cost you up to 80% of your bearing life in the first 30 seconds. Kind of makes it worth the time, don't it? The intake's next, and to keep its gasket in place, we'll use this handy high-tack stick. Plus, we'll lay down a nice welding bead of silicone front and back. Then, after laying down the gaskets, we carefully drop the intake in place. Next, a visual check of how our runners line up. And it don't get no better than that right there. Now, since our four corner bolt holes are blind, these only require some bolt lube. The eight center bolt holes go into the lifter valley where oil splashes around, so we'll coat these threads with sealant. Here's a little tip to ensure a quick, easy first time fire up. Instead of bringing the mark up to zero on the timing pointer on the compression stroke, bring it up to 25 degrees before top dead center. Since we're running a cast camshaft, we can use the steel gear that comes in our new HEI distributor. Don't forget the lube though. And as we install it, we want to make sure the rotor button is pointing to the number one cylinder. This will give us 25 degrees of initial timing, which should light right off. Before we can make up our set of custom plug wires, we need to install our valve covers and mock up our headers. We're using these billet aluminum wire looms and want to make sure everything's neat and away from exhaust heat. Our E3 diamond fires will get a little anti-seize to avoid damaging threads on the next plug change. Attach our boot ends, route our wires through the looms and lock them in place. Now we can cut them to length, crimp the ends on, and with boots installed, add some dielectric grease so the boots don't fuse to the terminals. And now we have an almost dyno ready 383 stroker. We're getting our street strip stroker ready for the dyno. It's a fully blueprinted 10 and a half to one compression, 383 cubic inch small block with a hydraulic roller valve train, 200 cc aluminum heads, and ported dual plane intake. We're shooting for at least 450 horsepower on premium pump gas. 
That fuel is going to feed this Summit 750 CFM carb. Now it has mechanical secondaries and a mechanical choke. It's got 77 jets in the primaries, 79s in the secondaries, and that's going to be our starting point. Plus it's been tumble polished to give it that shiny finish. We're running our exhaust through a pair of Magnaflow stainless mufflers, just like you'd use on the street. Now the stroker fires right up, and at 750 RPM, it's got a nice smooth idle. After going through the usual braking cycles, we typically make about eight runs to make sure the rings are sealed. The valve lash is good, and air to fuel is where we want it. So far, all the runs are pretty consistent, like this one at 6,000 RPM. 453 horsepower, 463 foot-pounds of torque. The engine seems to be a tad lean at the top end though, so we'll give it a little bit more fuel by going up a jet size in the rear. 459, 472. Our timing's set at 34 degrees, and the engine seems to like it there, so one more pull to 6,000. 461, 472. Torque stayed right where it should have been at 4,300. Yep. Oil pressure's good, air fuels are nice, water so temp was consistent and steady. 6,000. Very nice. And, uh, 43, it's 4,300 all day on torque. Yeah, good little street motor. Sweet. Somebody will be happy. That's it for the dyno, but not the engine. To get this thing ready to drop into a hot rod or just about any bow tie vehicle, we're going to install a serpentine system. A billet set up with aluminum water pump, alternator, AC compressor, power steering pump, and all the tensioners, pulleys, and brackets. And a new air cleaner tops it off, and this thing is road ready. A lot of you have asked us what happens to project engines like this once they're finished. And in the case of this one, well, the answer is we don't know. It could be going into your vehicle if you're the winner of the PowerBlock TV Ultimate Fan Contest. The winner gets the 383 stroker, shop tools to install it, and a prize package all worth $10,000. All you have to do is tell us why you're the Ultimate PowerBlock TV Fan. You can find details at our website or on our Facebook page. You can find us here next time.